Welcome to lecture 15. This lecture is on wigner brewallen perturbation theory. This is a method that you've probably not seen before. It is a technique that organizes the perturbation series in a different way. It effectively sums an infinite number of terms. Sometimes this is a better thing to do. Sometimes this is a worse thing to do. It actually turns out in many perturbative problems, these strategies that try to sum an infinite number of terms because they're not summing all of the infinite number of terms, they only are summing part of the infinite number of terms, they often give worse results than results that systematically truncate the expansions at given orders. That's what the Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory does. The wigner brewallen perturbation theory, as you'll see, is doing an infinite summation in some way of thinking about what is going on Whenever you have terms that involve the infinite summations, you either have to work out a strategy to find the solutions for the energies that is more complicated than just having an explicit formula, or you have to do an iterative procedure to update and recalculate the energies until after you iterate enough times, the energies stop changing. Okay? With that introduction, let's get into the meat of the subject. Let's recall from our previous work that the problem that we're trying to solve involves the Hamiltonian acting on the exact ground state, and the energy is En times that exact ground state. We separate the Hamiltonian into the unperturbed part, H0, and the perturbation, V. The unperturbed Hamiltonian, H0, has a set of eigenfunctions given by N sub 0 which satisfies H0 acting on N sub 0 is equal to EN0 times the state N sub 0. We rewrite the equation HN equals EN N as EN minus H0 N equals VN. And here we wrote it as EN, not EN0, and having a delta EN on the other side. So this is already a difference from what we did in the last lecture. Again, we're going to define projection operators onto the unperturbed eigenstate n sub 0 and perpendicular to it. And then if I apply a qn on the equation en minus h0 n equals vn, I can then divide by the en minus h0 as an operator and get that qn acting on the state n is equal to qn over en minus h0 v hat n. The issue here is a little bit unclear already compared to what we did before because the QN protects us from EN0 minus H0, but because it's a QN which is projecting perpendicular to the N0 state, it really is only protecting us in the case where the V hat is equal to zero. Now, again, because we can write the full state n as pn plus qn acting on n, we will have a pn times n plus this qn over en minus h0 v hat. And now we just do the same thing as we did before. We take the qn over en minus h0 v hat term, we bring it to the other side, and then we're going to divide by the inverse. So. We bring it to the other side. We have Pn times n, which is equal to n sub 0, 0 sub n, n. We are still going to take the normalization factor n sub 0 overlap with the full wave function n to be 1 so that we drop that term. And we have then that n is equal to 1 minus Qn over En minus H0 V hat inverse times the state n sub 0. And this is a little bit different from what we had before. This now has a very simple series that we can put in. It's just a geometric series, so we can write out the terms to arbitrary order using this. We have to keep in mind that the En that is appearing in this series is the exact eigenstate energy, not the perturbative energy. And we'll talk about how that gets solved in just a moment. Okay, so to find the En, we're gonna multiply En minus H0 N equals Vn by N sub 0. We're going to get En minus En0 using the fact that the normalization N sub 0 N is equal to 1 is equal to N sub 0 Vn. And then 
we substitute in what n is using that geometric series. So we'll get n sub 0 plus q over e n minus h 0 v hat n sub 0 and so forth. We bring the e n 0 from the left hand side to the right hand side and we get e n is equal to e n 0 plus v n n plus the sum m does not equal n v n m v m n over e n minus e m 0 and so forth. And here the key thing is that the e n appears on both sides. This is a iterative equation or it is a complicated equation that we now have to solve for e n. But the series is much simpler than what we used before. Now, as I had mentioned before, the real downside of this, because this acts as if it's summing an infinite number of terms from the original series, is that it often is less accurate than the standard Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation series. So to summarize these results, the full series for n becomes n is equal to the sum m equals 0 to infinity, q over e n minus h hat 0, v hat raised to the nth power, multiplying on the state n sub 0, e n is equal to e n 0 plus v n n plus the sum m does not equal n v n m v m n e n minus e m 0, plus a double sum with the restrictions on m and m prime, a v n m v m m prime v m prime n with the two energy denominators and then you'll get a term with four v's and three energy denominators and the general term has m v's and m minus one energy denominators. And all of the terms have a restriction where the e m zero does not equal the e n. Even though when we plug in the correct e n that term would not be infinity anymore. That is still the way that this series has been derived, and so we always have to remove that one term. All right, let's take a look at an example. That's actually it. We're done with deriving the wigner brewallen perturbation theory. It's a fairly simple thing to derive. So let's look at an example. We're going to take our harmonic oscillator, p squared over 2m plus 1 half kx squared. We're going to have our v be just a linear perturbation, constant times x hat. Now the exact solution you get, you may or may not have seen this, you get the exact solution by completing the square. So we write h as p squared over 2m plus 1 half kx squared plus cx. We rewrite that as p squared over 2m plus 1 half kx plus c over k quantity squared minus c squared over 2k so that we get our original Hamiltonian. We then define a new operator x prime hat to be x hat plus c over k. You can immediately see the commutator of x prime with p is equal to i h bar. So if I write my Hamiltonian as p squared over 2m plus 1 half k x prime squared minus c squared over 2k, the algebra and everything is exactly the same now when expressed in terms of x prime as we had before when we solved the original Hamiltonian problem. So the energy eigenvalues are just h bar omega times n plus a half. But we now have this shift, the minus c squared over 2k, which we have to keep in and then it's exact. The perturbation of the energy when we add this linear term to the harmonic oscillator, it just gives a constant shift to all energies. Okay? Now, we're going to work with this as in a perturbation series. So we're going to write Cx hat as C square root of h bar over 2m omega, a dagger plus a. If we calculate Vnn, that's the expectation value of Cx hat. Because we have unbalanced A and A dagger operators, we know that expectation value is equal to zero. In fact, we know V and M is equal to zero, except when M is equal to N plus or minus one. And if you go through the algebra and calculate what those matrix elements are, you find it's C square root of H bar over 2M omega square root of N plus one when it's N N plus one. And when it's N N minus one, it's C square root of H bar over 2M omega square root of N. Similarly, the energy differences, E n 0 minus E n plus 1 0 is minus h bar omega, and E n 0 minus E n minus 1 0 is h bar omega. Now, if I plug in the Rayleigh-Schrodinger formulas, the first order shift is 0. The second order shift, I get two terms, one for the V n n plus 1, one with the V n n minus 1. If we plug in what the squares of those guys are, the first one because the energy denominator is negative, I'll get one over h bar omega times a minus n plus one plus n. And when we go ahead and combine that, you see the n's are gonna cancel, I'll get a minus one. 
the h bar cancels i'll get divided by a 2 m omega squared but 2 m omega squared is just uh, m omega squared is just equal to k so that becomes minus c squared over 2k and indeed we get the correct answer okay now as a check we can evaluate the third order correction that will have these terms that involve the three v's vnm vmm prime vm prime n divided by the two energy denominators minus the vnn times the term that looks kind of like the second order perturbation theory term but the denominator is squared vnn is equal to zero so that second term vanishes in order to get vnm vm prime m vm prime n to be non-zero, we would need to connect the n to an m plus to an n plus or minus one, and then the m prime has to be equal to either n or n plus or minus two. But then, if that m prime is equal to n or n plus or minus two, it does not connect back to the n, so it has to be equal to zero in all cases, and that means that the third order energy shift is equal to zero. Similarly, for all delta E n of m, where m is bigger than or equal to 3, it's going to equal 0. I'm not proving that for you, but that is something that would come out if you went ahead and did the analysis of the Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory. How does it work for Wigner brewallen Well, again, we just have the two terms in that second order contribution, and all higher order ones are going to be 0. So we'll get this h bar omega n plus a half. That's the zeroth order one. The vnn is equal to 0. We still get the c squared h bar over 2m omega. We'll get an n plus 1 over e n minus h bar omega n plus 3 halves plus an n times e n minus h bar omega times n minus a half. And now you see the e n is on both sides. So we're going to multiply by this product e n minus h bar omega n plus 3 halves and e n minus h bar omega n minus a half in order to get a cubic term on the left hand side. And then we have to simplify the terms on the right-hand side. We're going to get a quadratic times these two terms that have to be added together. And now we have to go through the algebra. There's a lot of algebra to go through to get this into a simple form for the equation. It's a cubic equation that we get. That cubic equation has three roots to it. Okay, so there's some simplifications of the cubic equation. I do encourage you to pause the video, make sure that you can derive this cubic equation, and then look at the simplifications that we're getting as we go through this, all the way to getting the final result. Okay, so we have a cubic equation here. And if we could factorize this, we would be able to get uh, see whether or not it gives us the exact answer. So let's go ahead and plug in what the exact answer is and see if we can factorize it. But we find that it doesn't actually work. So if I take en and I subtract h bar omega n plus a half minus c squared over 2m omega squared, which then becomes a plus c squared over 2m omega squared, and try to see does that exactly divide this term, this polynomial here, we find that it does not. There's an extra term that's present there. So the result has an error of the order of c to the sixth over 2m omega squared cubed. So some of the roots of this cubic equation are incorrect. They're non-physical because there are three roots that we find. And we find that this calculation is not going to give us the exact result to second order, which means that there are some third order, some higher order contributions that are present that we need to actually calculate in order to get the correct result. And that is somehow coming from this infinite summation of terms. And in general, what we find is this wigner brewallen perturbation theory is less accurate than the Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory, as must be the case here. Even though I haven't calculated for you exactly what the root is, we know that the exact result is not a root. And that means that there are some issues with this, that the roots that you will get will be slightly off. And that means that you need to have some higher order terms to put in that will correct those roots and ultimately give you the exact answer. All right, so let's do a explicit check of this with n equals zero. When I plug in n equals zero, the equation simplifies. So let's plug in n equals zero. Then the equation we get is E zero 
is equal to h bar omega over 2 plus c squared h bar over 2m omega times 1 over e0 minus 3 halves h bar omega. The other term, the term where I would be lowering the energy, does not exist because I can't lower below the ground state energy. So in this case, I just get a quadratic equation. If I multiply by the e0 minus 3 halves h bar omega, I'll get e0 squared minus e0 times 3 halves h bar omega on the left-hand side. I'll get plus h bar omega over 2 e0 minus 3 halves h bar omega plus c squared h bar over 2 m omega. Let's bring everything over to the right-hand side to make that a quadratic equation. I'll get e0 squared minus e0 times 2 h bar omega plus 3 fourths h bar omega squared minus c squared h bar over 2 m omega, and that equals 0. There are two roots of this. I'm going to get h bar omega plus or minus 1 half, the square root of 4 h bar omega squared minus 3 h bar omega squared plus 2 c squared h bar over m omega. That becomes h bar omega plus or minus 1 half, the square root of h bar omega squared plus 2 c squared h bar over m omega. We're going to take the minus root because it turns out in perturbation theory, the ground state energy is always reduced. And, and we also need to take the minus root because in general, we have to make sure that at, in the limit where C is equal to zero, the energy will reduce to the energy that we would get for the unperturbed problem, which we know is h bar omega over two. So we have to take the minus sign, take the minus root. And now if I expand that square root in a power series, what you will find when we do that expansion is that we will get the exact result plus a correction term that is of order v to the fourth. So we have this extra term plus one fourth c to the fourth over k squared one over h bar omega. That term shouldn't be there. So this answer is only accurate up to the order of v to the fourth. And I have to put in a fourth order, I have to do a fourth order calculation to properly get the result through fourth order, but then I'm sure I will have an error to the order, to the sixth order. So in general, in this case, we have the situation that Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory gave us the exact or answer at second order, but wigner brewall in perturbation theory is gonna have to actually go to infinite order to give us the exact answer because the infinite number of terms that are summed are not all of the terms. The correct answer for the infinite summation is zero, but because we only have a partial summation, we're getting a non-zero result for the infinite summation of terms that we're including at a given order, and that is hurting us. Now, you could argue that, well, this is a very special case. It truncated at second order. If I looked at another situation, maybe uh, Wigner Brewallen will be better. There are some cases where Wigner Brewallen does actually give you better results, but this is not generic usually the wigner brewallen will give you a worse result. And this is actually even a very important result to remember if you go and you look at even more complicated situations like many body perturbation theory, where it often is the case there that a truncated perturbation theory is better than a perturbation theory that sums an infinite number of terms. But people often like to do summations of an infinite number of terms because they think it will be better. And that often is not the case. And that is just something for you to keep in mind now that you know the difference here. If you ever get into more advanced work with many body perturbation theory, that sometimes the truncated perturbation theories are actually better than the perturbation theories that try to sum an infinite number of terms. Just a useful fact to keep in mind. All right, that brings us to the end of lecture 15. In lecture 16, we're gonna be talking about degenerate perturbation theory and we're going to work out the full formalism in one lecture, but the formalism is sufficiently complicated that you really need to work it out in some examples. And we're going to work out many examples in the homework to be able to really understand all of the subtleties of degenerate perturbation theory, because there's a lot of issues, a lot of things that come up in degenerate perturbation theory that simply make your life difficult. Okay, that takes us to our end. We'll see you in lecture 16 next.